I'm Nanette Burstein, and I'm the director and executive producer of the documentary series Killer Sally. A jury will decide the fate of Sally McNeil, a female bodybuilder accused of killing her husband, another bodybuilder, on Valentine's Day last year. They're going to be going to a shelter because of what I did to Daddy. Sally McNeil has a tremendous physique, and she's married to she's Ray McNeil. She's married to Ray McNeil, who's certainly one of the most muscular pros alive. He looked like the statue of David. He was beautiful. Lust at first sight. Sally was the main breadwinner. They were into some funny stuff. <laughs> There's a CD side of bodybuilding. Nobody talks about it. A man would pay for what was known as muscle worship. It's basically muscle prostitution. If I wrestled 10 of them, that's $3,000. Made Ray happy that it was paying for his steroids. Then he hit me. 911, I just shot my husband because he just beat me up. You shot your husband? Yes. Sally McNeil took a shotgun and blasted her husband and shot him again in the face. I'm sorry if I disappointed you, Bill. She protected her kids like a wild animal. I remember how torturous it used to be to have to sit there and watch him abuse my sister and to know that I was next. Sally didn't talk about what was happening with Ray. And I've learned to suppress things and block them out. To me, this was a premeditated murder. He was shot in the face while on the ground. I have a right to defend myself. I couldn't take it anymore. I. I didn't want to die. Welcome to Factual America. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood. Each week I watch a hit documentary and then talk with the filmmakers and their subjects. This week it is my pleasure to welcome Nanette Burstein, the award-winning director of the new Netflix docuseries, Killer Sally. The film is the story of bodybuilding's most notorious crime, on Valentine's Day, 1995, national bodybuilding champion Ray McNeil was choking his bodybuilding wife, Sally, when she grabbed a gun and fatally shot him twice. Listen as Nanette joins us to discuss this complex true crime story. Nanette, welcome to Factual America. How are things with you? Uh, things are good. It's, uh, it's a big day today. Uh, you know, our series launches on Netflix, so... Uh... Uh, an eventful moment. Well, I mean, congratulations and uh, and and welcome to Factual America. It's a it's a pleasure and a on, real honor to have you on. Um, in case people weren't paying attention when the intro was running, we're uh, talking about Killer Sally. It's indeed a Netflix docu series uh, releasing. Is it everywhere today here on the November second? I know it's releasing in the UK it, today. It is everywhere. It is. No. Uh, it's global. Yes. Ex excellent. In, uh, Every country except, I think, three where Netflix doesn't air. Uh, so, as we were saying, uh, the docu series is uh, Killer Sally. Now, uh, it's just just dropped on Netflix, so many of our listeners and viewers will have not seen it yet. Um, so, I guess, and it is a true crime doc, though. I guess maybe not too much need for spoiler alerts but we will i mean encourage people to to watch it maybe first and then come back and 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 listen to uh our little chat here but uh maybe you can give us a bit of a synopsis what is what is killer sally all about well killer sally is one of the most notorious crimes in the bodybuilding world um killer uh, sally mcneil uh was an amateur bodybuilder a marine she was married to a professional bodybuilder, Ray McNeil, who was Mr. North America. Uh, they had a very tumultuous marriage, to say the least. And on Valentine's Day of 1995, Ray was allegedly choking out Sally. Uh, they had a fight and she got away from him. She ran and got a gun and fatally shot him twice. Uh, the, you know, Sally claim self-defense. Um, there had been a history of domestic abuse mm. and the prosecution claimed that Sally was a, a thug, a bully, and that it was premeditated murder. Mm. And really the, the series is about domestic violence. It's about gender roles and it's about the world of bodybuilding, which is an unusual one. 
Indeed, and an interesting uh, combination. I mean, I think it's, isn't it the DA who says that there's two types of, you know, cases? There's the a who done it and a what is it? And this is sort exactly. of, this is, this series is really. It's not a who done it. It's not a who done it. So hence why I said there might not be too many spoiler alerts at the Although same time. Although it is, it is, you know, who is at fault? And, and was it premeditated or was it self-defense? That's right. And we are, um, and you, and you have over, over three episodes, you know, definitely show us all the different, some, there are some twists and turns and, uh, and some, uh, different angles on this. And I guess it's, um, um, I mean, I found it extremely compelling. I, I personally, I'm not a, I'm not really that, I, I'm not one of these types that's really, really into true crime, but, uh, but I thought I found it extremely compelling, um, and you know, obviously the main character, the main subject is is uh, Sally McNeil. Although there's a lot of subjects beyond in terms of individuals as well as uh, the topics you've you've already mentioned. But um, you, you spent a lot of time with her. Did you ever really? Did you ever feel like you really got to know her? Because I, I think she it seems like she could be a difficult person to get to know. No, I definitely feel that way still feel yeah. that way um in fact i'm gonna see her this evening um uh yeah i feel that sally was you know very forthright surprisingly you know even with her own admissions you know she's she definitely has flaws and yeah. and owns up to them um and i did i do and did feel that i got to know her very well yeah yeah and so Basically, as you've already, you know, she was this, I mean, it's also an insight into, it's, it's, I guess the added element to this is it's all in the 1990s as, as, as well. I mean, 80s and, and 90s. So yeah. it's a, a look back on a, well, for someone like me, it's hard to believe that's a long gone era, but uh, it's, uh, you know, um, <laughs> um, I mean, you know, it, it's, uh, um, I mean, as you said, there is this, you know, there was this tumultuous relationship that they had um it was high profile i didn't hadn't quite appreciated but it was on all the like hard copy and these sort of places um you know the case was uh, beyond the local news um and i guess it's uh, i mean there's this as 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 you document i mean it's not just this it's it's all about the legacy of abuse throughout people's lives isn't it i mean um, it's not just they got, you know, th there was something that happened, pro you know, things that happened before they even, the two of them got together. Yeah, a lot of the series, I mean, yes, there's a crime at the center of it. And there is this issue of what was the motivation, who is at fault. And there's a, you know, there's certainly a mystery that was twists and turns. Um, sorry, I don't know if you heard the horn, <laughs> but there are twists and turns in the story. Uh, but it's also very much about this cycle of abuse. And Sally and Ray both came from abusive homes. Uh, Sally and Ray, Sally had kids and Ray was abusive to Sally's kids. And mm. they as adults have dealt with their own issues of being in abusive situations and are very much trying to break the cycle of violence. So it, it takes us up to contemporary days and, and it's a very tough cycle to, to, to change. It really is. And people deserve enormous credit for getting beyond it, which I think her kids, I think people hopefully will come away with how much they have been through and struggle with. Well, indeed. And, and I think if they also come across as just incredibly brave and strong individuals, uh, given they what they do. Are. And yet yeah. they're really fragile, you know, and still are fragile yeah. so more than i realized um and you know i just i think it's it's very hard you know they very boldly wanted to tell their story and and mm -hmm. uh you know but it is reliving trauma and that's a very difficult thing to do yeah, i mean i mean both of them i mean the the daughter and the son but the son especially i mean he's even i don't know how old was he when the the the, the death occurred you know that this the incident happened and he's He's talking about how he wanted to have a chance to testify in court and, and yeah, like he that. was nine years old when the incident happened, and I was shocked at his yeah. level of recall. I mean, I really wasn't 
I actually waited to interview him for a while because he was not in a great place initially. Um, yeah. Not that he said no, but I just didn't want to approach him while he was yeah. just dealing with some personal stuff. And he was in a better place and he very much wanted to do it. You know, he, it was important to him and he, he really, he wanted to do it because for his mom and he wanted to do it because he wanted to help other people in this situation in a domestic violence situation. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was amazed at not only what he remembered, but how uh, insightful he was, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, he experienced this as a child, but then he was able to process it and to have this adult insight into it that is so poignant, um, mm. angry at times, understandably, and yeah. so forthright. I mean, it's really haunting. Um, yeah. And he stands by everything he said. I just spoke to him today, and you know, he feels exactly the same today as he did in that interview. And yeah. and uh, you know, he was relieved when he. Yeah. The night that Ray was shot, he was asleep in the bedroom and he woke up from the mayhem after the 911 call and he had to step over Ray's body to get out of his room. And he says, and he still says today, all he felt was enormous relief that he and his mom and his sister would never be abused again, that it was over. No, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, as a filmmaker, I've I've asked this filmmakers before with these sort of uh, um, these subjects and topics I mean what 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 is the challenge when you're interviewing people like who who are having you're, you're make you're having to make them relive this I mean there's even people who are not directly rela- involved but who are involved and who they themselves say oh now I'm having to relive all this again you know yeah how, how do you how do you handle that how do you tackle it I mean you I mean a... I'm not making them because they willfully sit down to do the interview well, I and mean, they know yeah, yeah. what they're getting into I mean certainly no one does it against their will uh, and I think that you know when once and obviously you know they want to tell their story I mean they may you know have second thoughts is it's about to come out that typically can happen with some people they're like oh my god how is this going to come up what did i say and they get nervous and that that's not unusual but Mm. in that moment they're very they they want to tell their story um and if they don't that's a bad interview i mean it's just not you know and end up using it um so i just allow a space for them to be forthright and very present in the moment and just asking them questions based on the, you know, I, I write a list of questions, but then I don't look at them when I'm in it. I just, yeah. you know, have kind of memorized in my head, probably like you do right now in this interview and you kind of mm. go where the conversation flows. Exactly. I mean, um, and in, in terms of this, I mean, I would guess you probably didn't know that much about bodybuilding before you got into this. I mean, as you're unpeeling this onion, what did you, what did you discover and what did it, you know, how, what surprised you? A lot uh, of things, well, I'm sure. a lot, actually. A lot surprised me about bodybuilding. I didn't know that much about it. I mean, I watched Pumping Iron and, you know, right. knew about Mr. Olympia contest. But beyond that, I wasn't really that familiar with it. Um, I mean, first of all, I learned how intense it is, you know, to get to that level. Uh, you know, how much work and how few people, but then, you know, that part, I guess, is not that surprising getting any, any level of sport to be at the top, you know, takes that kind of determination. I think what surprised me, and I also expected the empowerment. I, I get that, you know, for a lot of people, it's like, it's, it's, it's really empowering, mm-hmm. especially women, but I think men too, to feel that kind of strength is amazing. But on the flip side, you, it's so unhealthy. It is so, so unhealthy, like beyond anything that I realized. I mean, yes, I realized, okay, I'm sure there's drugs involved of steroids and HGH or whatever, what have you. And I didn't realize they didn't test for it at all, which they don't. Um, And also you're at your most unhealthy just before a competition, because in order to have your veins pop and be striated, you need to massively carb depletes you're basically starving yourself and you're dehydrating yourself intentionally and you're on a massive amount of drugs Drugs. so 
you know, you are pushing your body to limits that it should not be pushed to. So on the one hand, it's psychologically empowering. On the other hand, it's physically damaging. Like this thing that we think, oh my God, look how amazing they are. They work so hard to get to this level of being so strong. And it does take so much hard work and determination, but it's not good for you. Um, and, you know, a lot of people have suffered the detriments of that. Um, it's also, you know, some people can fall into, there's a level of narcissism that needs to happen because mm. you have to practice your poses, you know? It's a very subjective sport. And, and yeah. uh, you have to stand in front of a mirror and practice how you pose all the time, which, you know, then causes you to maybe not, you know, there's a, there, there could be a form, not for everyone. I'm not saying this. I mean, mm. for some people it doesn't happen, but I think for some people there's a form of anorexia, you know, not, not anorexia, but like whatever the word would be related to your muscles and you, you have body dysmorphia. You don't see yourself or what you look like, mm. um, which pushes you to go further and further, be unhappy with yourself. And that's unhealthy too. So there are, pluses and minuses to this more than your average sport. Yeah. And I mean, just besides the physical toll it takes, and I think you've alluded to it, is also that it must be the psychological toll. I mean, it's you're doing that to your body. It's, it can't but help affect your mental uh, side of things, I would imagine. Um, well, that's what I mean. You know, yeah. by studying your body to that detail is probably an unhealthy yeah. situation. I, I mean, I, I thought it was interesting in the first episode you, that even the children talk about, you know, they'd go off to Disneyland or wherever they were going and people would just stare at them because uh, here are their parents who look like, uh, I don't know, superhero toys or dolls walking yeah. walking, walking down the street, you know, yeah. and people just staring at them. You know, people were staring don't... at them, you know, mainly because of that, but also, you know, it was the late 80s, early 90s. They were in an interracial marriage. True. They're kids, dark skin with bleach blonde hair. I'm not ble bleach. It was naturally like blonde hair. Mm. They were unusual in every way. Beautiful, beautiful. children. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. gorgeous. But definitely for all those reasons stand out. And then there's, I mean, it's also at a time when women are just getting into bodybuilding, isn't it? And and so um, that was interesting to, to, I guess, how things have changed, I gather, in the last... Uh, 30 years or so, but also this whole, I mean, there are all these other sort of cultures and, and, and dynamics to what women had to go through who wanted to be bodybuilders in order to, you know, make a living, support themselves. Um, obviously. Yeah. Yes. You know, and there was, there was a Washington post article just last week, um, about contemporary female bodybuilding, which I don't get into because my story doesn't take place then. Yeah. Um, and it's really disturbing. I mean, the, so many women are being exploited. They're asked to pose new to do nude photos by the people in charge, and they feel pressured to do it. And it's mm. it's really horrible. Um, it, it it unfortunately lends itself to the possibility of exploitation. I mean, any kind of sport that is subjective like that, and mm. you know, is run by a handful of people <laughs> and kind of under the radar. Of, it's it's it can get into some weird situations particularly for women yeah, yeah. well i think that actually uh, um on that on that note i guess that takes us to a good point to maybe uh, give our listeners uh, a quick early break uh, we'll be right back with nanette bursting the director of killer sally a netflix docuseries that dropped today on november 2nd uh, do do check it out you're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Alamo Pictures to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back to Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with Nanette Burstein, the director and executive producer of Killer Sally, a Netflix docuseries that has premiered uh, today, November 2nd, uh, hopefully this episode will be releasing fairly soon as well. Um, Nanette, um, what drew you to this story? I mean, you've got an illustrious career. You haven't, had you done anything like tr this before, any sort of true crime, what, what we broadly call true crime? 
Um, yeah, I have actually done true crime uh, in, in the same way that this is, that it's really, it's, it's the kind of case that lends itself to a bigger issue of social importance yeah. uh, and is more character based. So I did a film uh, for ESPN 30 for 30 on That's Tanya right. Harding in mm. 2014 um, called The Price of Gold. I did a film for Showtime about John McAfee mm -hmm. and the crimes that he committed in Belize. Uh, so I'm not new to delving into uh, the genre. Um, mm. I do it in my in my own way, uh, not gratuitously. Um, I'd like to think, and uh, it's usually because the case itself is about something much bigger that I care about, and that was definitely the case here. I mean, uh, you know, one out of every three women globally is the victim of physical and or sexual violence by an intimate partner. It's a huge problem, mm -hmm. and we 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 put it, we 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 sweep it under the rug, you know. And and I think that uh, Sally's case definitely sheds light on the fact that we need to revisit how we judicially and socially deal with domestic violence cases, um, mm -hmm. particularly when it comes to claims of self defense. Uh, I also felt like it was important to talk about the gender roles that were very. Mm -hmm unusual in the story given Sally's background and how she was portrayed in the media as an angry woman as mm. not being able to be a victim because of her physical strength you know she was called the pumped up princess and the brawny bride and all this ridiculous alliteration that lends itself to tabloid <laughs> journalism yeah. um and, you know, so those are the reasons that I, I want to do it. And Sally was very gung-ho about telling her story, which is incredibly important to me, that the subject wants their story to be told in the situation and wants to share their side of it. Um, the producers had contacted her uh, a while before I got involved, and mm. uh, she said she wanted to do it and supported the project through the entire process. So... So it was the producers that came up with the idea for the for the series. It is, yes. So Neighborhood Watch, uh, right. which is a company run by uh, Richard Pete and Tracy Carlson, um, had read in 2016, they had read an old, somehow come across an old tabloid magazine story about Sally's case yeah. and felt in that Me Too reckoning era, right. like, hey, there's probably more to this story, I suspect. Mm -hmm. And wrote her a letter, and she responded quite favorably. Hmm. And, and she was. It went, went from there. Yeah, and and as you say, you, you know, on the issues, it's um, um, it's, it's it's exploring. I mean, it says a lot about prevailing attitudes then. But do you see? I mean, I think your you, the series also points out that some of these have not changed in the last. 30 years. I mean, there's this too much of an easy, it's too easy to say, well, that was the nineties, you know, and things are different now. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, you know, it's, sometimes it's helpful to look at cases that happened in the past because you can see them with a more objective lens having, you know, looking in the rear view mirror for everyone. Yeah. But that said, it's just as relevant today, unfortunately. Um, a lot, there's still so many cases of women that have defended themselves. Um, and murdered their spouses and, and uh, because of the specifics of how it came out, like maybe their husband turned around when they shot him or yeah. maybe in Sally's case, they shot him twice and not just once. And right. so all these things are used and it's very hard to prove self-defense, um, especially imminent threat. Um, there's so many ways to argue against it. And, you know, what are women supposed to do? I mean, the most, dangerous time for women is when they leave you know because most people are like why don't you just leave and right. it's not easy to leave especially when you have kids especially when you don't have financial resources and she was actually ready to go and unfortunately this happened beforehand um uh just terrible timing but even so even when they do leave that's the that is the number one time when women, women get murdered mm. um, and there's no way to protect yourself like you know even if you have uh, protective order against your spouse, the police can't guard you 24 hours a day. Like, that's, you know, so it's, uh, it's really hard to get out of that situation. I mean, what do you think? I mean, I just thought of this. What does it say about, I, 
criminal justice seems to so so often come down to almost almost performance you know a, a da i mean I, I i mean there's no doubt everyone knows she she shot uh ray so there's no that's yeah, not in doubt. No dispute about that yeah. yeah no disagreement but this you know um the way the da doing his job but perf- performs and gets puts his case forward and how uh, her defense de- attorney, who you have on, uh, who, you know, talks about the difficulties he had in doing the case. And then I think this also this lack of understanding of what women are going through in t- cases like this. So she doesn't do this. She she fell asleep while being interviewed or in an interview know. room. You know, she, <laughs> she you know, these, these kind of things are like, well, what, I don't know. How many of us even have any idea what it must, you know, what, what are you going through at a time like that? And then her own natural personality trait, which was, I think as the D- DA said, she made the mistake. She admits it was a mistake going on to the stand, but then she just, she, she became a different, in some ways, a different person in that she just kind of, as he said, became the perfect Marine and just was kind of very stilted and yes and no answers and nothing. And it was just the wrong, the wrong, uh, you know, that, that a fateful decision maybe was the difference between having to serve, what did she serve, 25 years and serving 10 or, or whatever. It, it would yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, going on the stand was a terrible mistake. Her lawyer strongly advised her against it. Yeah. It's never a good idea for defendants to go on the stand. And also, they're just not in the right frame of mind. I mean, think about, you know, you can't uh, express yourself normally in that situation. And and you're being attacked by a prosecutor. You're you're so tense. And yes, she she said yes, sir, no, sir, like an obedient Marine. And Mm. but the worst part of that was is that um, not to give away too much, but she uh, you know, she, her the reason why the series is called Killer Sally is that oh, right. it was her wrestling stage name, and you know he asked her if she was known by the name Killer Sally, and she says no because in her regular life she's not, and she wasn't thinking that way, and that opened the door for them to say, oh well, you're lying, and then they show this poster of her, a poster that she did for her mm-hmm. wrestling gigs. Um, holding the murder weapon because it was the gun that she had in her house and and it says killer sally now that is not evidence of anything because we know she has the gun mm-hmm. and that's just your stage name and it's just a promotional poster but you know that was very damaging for the jury to put the gun in her hands as a visual and call herself killer sally yeah. um so yeah there is a perf- performance level. I mean, some of the stuff that the prosecution was openly saying in court is, you know, Sally can't be a victim because, you know, she's, she's too buff. She's, yeah, exactly. She's too buff. Uh, and then she's violent and a violent woman can't be a victim. Now yeah. she does have some history of violence herself. Yeah. She's not a perfect yeah. victim. A lot of victims are not perfect. They come from abusive backgrounds. But that doesn't mean there's not still victims, you know, and then that's what makes the story complicated. I mean, when I was making it, you know, I, there were times where I went back and forth. Well, you know, is she guilty? Is she not guilty? Um, uh, you know, I personally have come away with feeling that she's absolutely not guilty. But I mean, you know, other audience members may come to their own conclusion about that. Um, I certainly present all sides of it. But yeah, some of the some of the arguments which she was convicted on are totally bogus yeah, yeah. not you know, factual yeah, no no i completely agree i mean and i think well uh, you wouldn't have obviously as a, as a as a talented filmmaker you wouldn't have had it any other way but you do let the viewer make their own decision i mean you 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 do present the sides and people again uh, you should have a watch and have and come to your own conclusions but uh, i will say i had extreme compassion for in that one particular moment as well when the de- the defense attorney said she's an extremely literal person and i'm an extremely literal person if someone had asked me are you known as killer matt i would have said no you know and then that just yeah. and then that totally oh, as they as they pointed out that that then all the stuff that wasn't admissible before became admissible and That's correct. And she is a very literal person. I mean, even even today, like in her yeah. interview, every question I'd ask her, she's very literal yeah. the way she responds to things. It's just her personality. 
And uh, unfortunately, that does not bode well in a court of law. Well, I'm, I'm, I certainly are hoping not to be in a court of law any, any time <laughs> yeah, soon. I think all of us are. <laughs> <laughs> I think so, exactly. Yeah. I mean, you were, so while you were doing this project, were you also working on the Hillary project? At the, no, were they, no, did they, this was afterwards. Was this afterwards? Okay. Yes, yes. But, but did you ever, do you ever contrast with this other projects? I mean, I'm not that, uh, I, I'm not, they're, they're very different. I haven't seen the Hillary doc, actually, to be honest with you, but. Uh, um, you should watch it. Yeah, I should. I definitely <laughs> going to now. Uh, well, but. You should, but hopefully you'd like to. No, yeah. I think, but do you think, is, I mean, maybe I'm re is trying to put too much into this, but two, I mean, very different, but also both polarizing figures in their way, I would argue between Sally and Hillary. Do you think, does that say anything about how women are in the, in the public eye? Well, I definitely uh, seem to have told now three stories about women who are villainized in the nineties. And while Hillary was first lady and, and yeah. also, you know, very much admired, she was also villainized at the same time as Tanya Harding was certainly yeah. villainized and thought of as the angry woman, much like Sally. So I definitely um, very interested in these kinds of stories and mm. because I think they're still very relevant today. I think that, you know, women that don't fit into a certain mold, they, you know, are highly judged and to mm. their detriment. I think, you know, even like you look at female politicians today, like they just can't win. Uh, any, any female in mm. the public sphere is judged in a way that men are not. Um, and God forbid, you know, you're in a defamatory situation, <laughs> like good luck to you, you know, if you're, if this is your gender, uh, it's, mm. it's worse. And, uh, you know, I'm not trying to whine about it. I just think that that's the truth. Yeah. Did the uh, 30 for 30 come out before the I, Tanya? Yeah, no, actually, the writer watched it on ESPN and it was inspired to write I, Tanya based on my documentary. And what did you think of I, Tanya? That was really good. Yeah. 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 No, I think because you, you have some experience with narrative as well, don't, don't you? I do, yes. I've done both, although I favor documentaries. Yeah. And is that, uh, so what that brings us to, and I, I, it's hard to believe we're already coming to the end of our uh, our time together. I know. But, so, I it's it, it, by. Uh, but uh, what, it, what is next for you? Are you able to, I mean, I know you're living in the moment that is uh, Killer yeah, yeah. Sally at the moment, but... Uh, Anything else? Uh, I'm working works? on a uh, I'm working on a documentary on Liz Taylor for HBO, and uh, oh, I have yeah. uh, some amazing archival footage from her estate and unseen and heard interviews with her. So that is wow. my current project. And I'm just I'm just now thinking: Has there ever really? There's not really been a Liz Taylor doc, has there? Nothing. Um, nothing that's has been a standout now. That's amazing. That's uh, so. When 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 should we expect to see that? Uh, hopefully, in a year from now. Okay. Well, if we haven't scared you off, we'd love to have you on again. So. No, that... thank you. <laughs> no, you haven't scared me off at all. Thank you. <laughs> so when that drops, we'd love to. I hope you you can come back and just want to thank you again. Um, um, uh, just to remind our listeners, we've been talking with Nanette Burstein, the director and executive producer of Killer Sally, the Netflix docu series. It's three episodes. Highly recommend it. It uh, it flies by, hopefully, like it, this uh, episode uh, has as well. And it's uh, uh, really uh, very compelling, very uh, very interesting and poignant uh, stories. And and um, uh, yes, again, I, I do highly recommend it. So um, uh, thanks again, Nanette. Love to have you on again. And uh, enjoy the Thank rest you. of your day. Thank All you. Right. Thank you very much for having right. me. Okay. Take care. I also would like to thank those who helped make this podcast possible. A big shout out to Sam and Joe at Intersound Audio in York, England. A big thanks to Amy Ord, our podcast manager at Alamo Pictures, who ensures we continue getting great guests onto the show and that everything otherwise runs smoothly. Finally, a big thanks to our listeners. Many of you have been with us for four incredible seasons. Please keep sending us feedback and episode ideas, whether it is on YouTube, social media, or directly by email. Please also remember to like us and share us with your friends and family, wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. 
You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Almo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.